My name is Sosa Castillo. I'm an associate professor of history at, here at Vanderbilt and also direct the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latinx Studies. We're thrilled to have with us professors Alexi and Selke uh, with us for today's program, which is part of our ongoing activities related to Haiti Week. This is the sixth annual uh, iteration of Haiti Week at Vanderbilt. Um, and we do it as a way to in part promote language program that offer, uh, and also just to more to stimulate more discussion, more critical discussion around Haitian history, culture, and, and Haitian studies more generally. Our programs this year are co-organized with the Black Cultural Center and the Center for Second Language Studies. I'd like to certainly thank and recognize the effort of the staff of the center, and in particular to uh, thank once more uh, Colleen McCoy's efforts making this week happen. This is her fourth year leading uh, the Haiti Week program, and please do see the website that she designs uh, for a full slate of the activities um, and as a way to also learn more about tomorrow's events, which include the, the Creole and Crema. Um, and for Vanderbilt community, please remember that the Caribbean Studies Association is putting on rhythm and bounce this evening at the Black Cultural Center. So it's my honor as I will start to introduce both of today's guests to also let you know about the format uh, where Dr. Alessi will speak first, followed by a response and discussion with Dr. Selke, and then we'll pivot to a larger discussion with the audience. So we're delighted to have with us Veline Alexi, Associate Professor of Africana and Comparative American Studies at Oberlin College. Uh, she received a PhD in Latin American history from U U University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she also has uh, uh, specializations in the graduate certificate in Caribbean and Latino studies. And we were just talking before how honored we are to um, be on these kind of parallel intellectual tracks uh, with, with UF, UMass Amherst. She later held a postdoctoral fellowship at Rutgers University in Africana and Critical Caribbean Studies. We're here today to discuss her prize-winning book, Heidi Fight, Haiti Fights Back, um, The Life and Legacy of Charlemagne Peralte. Um, published by Rutgers University Press in 2021 and winner of the Haitian Studies Association Book Prize for 2021. Uh, Haiti Fights Back was also recognized by the Times Literary Supplement as one of their books of the year. It's also my great pleasure to introduce uh, our colleague, uh, Gretchen Selke, who will be the respondent and moderator today. Selke is the Assistant Director of COAX and received her PhD in Spanish and Portuguese from Vanderbilt University. Her research areas include Latinx, Afro-Latinx, and Caribbean Studies. She's on the leadership team of the Latino section of LASA, where she was elected as secretary. She is also the managing editor of the Afro-Hispanic Review and author of the forthcoming article, uh, Uncommon Commonwealth, Race, Place, and Gender in Modern Puerto Rican Fiction. So uh, that said, we're looking forward to a wonderful program and thank you once more for joining us. Perfect, thank you all for the lovely invite, inviting me to the Haiti week, what I'm calling the carnival, the intellectual carnival party with Kribas. I love it. So thank you all for being here as well during Black Legacy Month as we go into Women's Herstories Month as well. So just wanted to uh, enact a Haitian tradition. So when we're recounting stories, whether it's in the playground or the backyard or at the barbershop or the beauty salon, oftentimes before we'll start a tale will say une in Haitian Creole, which means honor, and then the audience will respond respect, which means with respect. So y'all could type it in or you could unmute yourself as I say, une, and you say respect. respect. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so let me, I feel like my screen is already shared, right, Colleen? Not quite. You'll go back down to share. Screen. Okay, let me go back to it and we'll just start. Wonderful. Perfect. And I just need to 
move you all away from my, yeah, so y'all can see the whole thing. So wonderful artwork by Edouard duval Calier, one of our award-winning painter, sculptors, person. And these are some of his artworks. And then the figure on my right is an homage to the Haitians, really Africans, because Haiti is not quite Haiti at the time, who fought in Savannah, Georgia, um, and helped the United States achieve its US American revolution. So just wanted to put memory, but also art side by side on these slides. So I always begin the study of IET in continental Africa, right? Just to remind people that it is not a country, obviously, that it has over 54 countries, multiple languages, multiple contributions, in addition to being the cradle of humankind. And you sort of see these African kingdoms as well as queendoms and empires all throughout here. And one of the things that I implore students to do is to consider the fact that although places like Shanghai or perhaps the Congo are going to be subsumed and colonized by racist, violent European individuals, what you find is that the Zulu kingdom um, is still around in the 1800s, right? So thinking about the long array of violence, but also the long array of Black survival as well as Black resistance, which I think is always important to emphasize. So then we see these characters here, right? Real life individuals who are given mm, European names or perhaps America's names. So an IET, Haiti, we've encountered Francois Macandel, who's seen as sort of like this magical Afrofuturistic figure who, you know, engaged Vodun, one of the legacies of Africans who were in bondage, um, engaged Vodun and created what is known as Macandel packets that had herbs for healing enslaved Africans and Maroons as well, but also had herbs that dupliciously then um, poisoned slave owners as well as overseers. So you sort of see how Haitians commemorate the memory of Francois Macandel with this um, use of the coin, right? And this is one of the things that I love about Caribbean practice and pedagogy. The materials always showcase these people as alive, one, and then two, they're in the public, right? So it's not just a statue. It's something that we're using and reflecting on of what did Francois Macandel do up until his death in 1757? And then front and center, we encounter Queen Nanny, um, said to be from the Asante kingdom on the left of that map of the continent. And she becomes the leader of the Windward Maroons in Jamaica. And Jamaicans themselves are fighting against, obviously, British colonialism. And you sort of see Queen Nanny in her regalness. Obviously, this is a modern interpretation of what Queen Nanny looks like, them paying homage to the fact that Black women, whether it's from the continent or Harlem, Harlem or Costa Rica, we wrap our hair. We put on jewelry that adorn our necks. And in her case, that jewelry hints at homeland, hints at continental Africa. Side by side with Queen Nanny, we run into Tacky, Mr. Tacky. Sometimes I'll call him Joseph Tacky. Again, not names, you know, that are part of the Ashanti Kingdom or the Wolof Kingdom or the Shanghai Kingdom back then, but certainly today we're known as Evelyn, we're known as Joseph, we're known as Nani, um, etc. But Tacky himself really standing in his outfit, his attire, his military attire, and in all of his blackness, donning a gun ready to resist against violence. British racist in particular. And I think Dr. Vincent Brown just uh, wrote another book about uh, Tacky himself. So just thinking about us boarding these ships, right? But starting the story with us creating, helping to create civilization, whether politically, economically, spiritually, and when we land in these societies, right? Forcibly so, this is how we arrive, right? Full, ready to survive, but also to resist. So I always begin there. And then we come here <clears throat> to some of the many dispossessing images that we see of Africans. And I emphasize Black women being accosted and violated in public, but also private, right? So what does it mean that your slave owner, whether male or female or them, abuses you in that way? What does it mean for you to stand in the sun holding an instrument of torture and violence? 
what does it mean to be branded? And if you look at the fleur de lis, which is what the branding is used for from France in Saint-Domingue, what is uh, modern day Haiti, you sort of see the correlation of the fleur de lis with this code noir that is written here. And again, I invite students and, you know, just learners in general, like here's the fleur de lis, this is beautiful flower, and yet it's being stamped onto Black people's bodies who dare to resist, who dare to seek freedom, who dare to seek liberty. And you sort of see in this code noir here that obviously applies to Louisiana, that is then part of Saint-Domingue, the various uh, tiers of how the fleur de lis comes, right? So you're reported to the police, your ears are cut off, etc., etc., and you could be put to death for seeking the very liberty and freedom that France is seeking, and of course the U.S. is seeking at the same time. So thinking about the hypocrisy of white supremacy, right? We come here, some of these more haunting images, whether it's a slave baracun that uh, Caribbean intellectuals, but also artists write very um, good prose about, poetry, fiction, music. And looking at the side of the baracun against this picturesque image of palm tree and perhaps sunshine, right? To stretch the enslaved person that has been made to crouch and not flee on that voyage from Africa to the Americas or perhaps to Europe. Um, they're allowed to air out to be bathed, to be shined with lemon and what was then, what we know today as shoe polish for them, for their melanin to pop, if you will. And then we're faced with this haunting image of this sister, sometimes read as male, um, sometimes read as female. And the story that we're told about her, and this is one of the things that infuriates me, is we don't know her name, right? We don't know any of these people's names in these archives. And thinking about silence as active agencies of violence, right? So silence and violence existing side by side with each other. What we can tell from this woman is that perhaps she's mixed given the color of her eyes perhaps because of her uh, hair texture. But then we see instruments of torture, whether it's the thing uh, holding her neck or whether it's that muzzle piece, right? Sometimes they would cut your tongue off, right? Because you were recalcitrant and talked back or you refused to work or you refused to reproduce. Sometimes this was caught because you ran away, etc. So we don't know her story, but what we do know is that defiantly she is facing and looking at the person, capturing this image of violence very casually and very intimately considering like we see marks on her face and the counters of her body. And then we go here, and it's one of those images that really sticks out to me because we know this woman just gave birth. I mean, her breasts are voluptuous, they're heavy with this breast milk nutrition, and yet she's bare. She's not shielded from the public eye. It's exposed, like Black women's bodies are exposed without their volition or consent. But the thing that always sticks out to me is how she caresses her baby girl. That child is like lovingly under her, my right side, right? But the child also has jewelry that reminds you of Queen Nanny, perhaps. The child's hair is adorned, again, with a head wrap, perhaps shielding her because maybe she's Muslim. Or maybe it's part of this tradition of whatever kingdom or queen kingdom or empire that they came from in Africa. So just seeing family and maternal care, I think side by side with the dispossessing images is important for us to consider and reflect on as well. And then we're assaulted with these images. And this is at the point where the athletes who take my class repeatedly get up and walk away. Professor, I need to go to the bathroom um, as they try to catch their throat or wipe a tear. One of my students is actually from Darlington, South Carolina. And I purposefully put this image because people think Brianna Taylor or Dr. Sandra Bland is an anomaly. And yet you see this woman being lynched and her black body being consumed by the white participants, whether male, female, or them, outside of a seemingly courthouse or an institutional building that has politics or perhaps economics. We're seeing how they're practicing a division on the bottom image with the African male sprayed out or splayed out and the black man then enacting the violence as the white overseer or perhaps the white slave owner looks. The black woman whose head is wrapped now is tending to this white baby, perhaps looking down because she cannot face that her patriotic kin, um, whether he's from Ashanti or whether he's from the Zulu nation is being whipped in such a fashion. 
because I went to Cornell and because I'm now at Oberlin, we actually have some of these material sources about slavery, whether it's the piece that holds um, Africans together, whether it's the Gore slave stick um, that was used to beat Africans or whether it was the shackles kept all over our bodies. And so we look at these images and again, thinking about how black people are presented in homogeneous, almost monolithic ways. And I bet if we just do a visual scan of this room, ain't none of us looking alike except maybe the skin tone, right? But we have different hair textures, we have different facial features, eye colors, etc. But you sort of see the creation of what do black men, what do black children, and what do black women look like? So then we go to IT or what's colonially divided as Saint Domingue. And I think about like, what does it mean to restore your nation so that it becomes IET? But what does it mean for you to be from let's say Shanghai or Timbuktu and to now be made into an IECN or an IECN, right? And so what we're told by CLR James and so many of the wonderful people who faced these stories of the past, these horrid stories of the past is that the life expectancy of an indigenous, right? The Tainos, the Sibonese, the Arawaks, et cetera, or in African was only seven years in Saint-Domingue because of the backbreaking uh, labor for coffee, for tobacco, for sugar, right? And so we have these categories where race and class and ethnicity and nationality are gonna collide. So we have the French officials who are, you know, obviously are from France, who are serving as the uh, governor general, if you will, those French clergy people, because church and colonialism go side by side at this time. And so you sort of see the French saying, Grand Blanc means those with means. They own large plantations. Petit Blanc could be a shopkeeper, could be an overseer, it just means, uh, big or small. Then we have these free Blacks, the Jean de Coulet of folks who, you know, are born uh, with consent, but overwhelmingly without consent, right? And their variations, they could be free based on the Code Noir, but then the Code Noir could shift and say, you know what though, your mom was a whole slave, so no, you will be a slave as well. So you sort of see this Jean de Coulet population, the free Blacks occupying uh, multiple variations and are frozen in history as sort of like problematic figures because many of them them would own slaves in order to free them, and a vast majority of them own slaves in order to keep their wealth and also ascend to the grand blanc status that you see here. Then we have these Africans who, as we know, are the purest examples of people seeking liberty and seeking democracy and seeking revolution, right? These are the people that are working these plantations who are dying year one, year three, year seven. They could be Mawon, meaning Maroons. They're escaping into Haiti's mountainous terrains, sometimes with negotiations with slave owners and colonizers, oftentimes not, however. And at the gut, even though France is calling for equality, fraternity, and liberty, it's really this African population that is calling an all three, right? So they're like this purest example of what does liberation and revolution desire, but also actions look like. And so I present the images of Haitians today because they look like the Haitians back then when we see the black and white. So all of these are Haitian people. Eduardo Valcaille that you see on the farthest left is the one that had the painting at the beginning of my slide. And obviously y'all know why Clef Jean award, Grammy award winning uh, rapper, part of the Fugees that are staging a comeback um, post COVID. So then we go here, let me go back. And I love this. I found this whew, in the archives and it made me so happy because I kept reading Oficia Mexican, right? And it's like this um, supplementary part of this newspaper. And the thing that I fixated on was the fact that they had this section called Neg Mawon. And I'm like, oh, what is this? I'm like going through these various issues. And what they're documenting is that look, on Saint Marc IET, which is like in the middle, Jacques Mel, which is like the Southern part right here, or Leogan, which is the top above of San Mark, people are in resistance, right? They're talking about they're fleeing. They could be 18 years old. They could have been here for 16 um, days, etc. So it's very, it's interesting how colonizers and later imperialists keep very meticulous records, which works really well for those of us who study the past, but then also angers us because you're just like, you're recording resistance as recalcitrant behavior, as um, just stubborn behavior, bandit behavior, vagabond. And pay attention to the dates, 17th 79, right? So thinking about just the age of revolution across the Americas, whether it's nearby United States 
or um, in Europe with France, how Africans are participating in this. And I just think this is so, you know, like jum jum. So then we have this image of Jean-Jacques de Saline, one of the forefathers of Haiti's revolution. And you sort of see in the way Jean-Jacques de Saline is said to have spoken, this is how he sees himself. He's saying, liberté or l'amo, um, liberty or death. He's fully outfitted in military attire. He is not in shackles. He's not in tattered um, clothing. He assumes the same role that we see happening in France or that we see happening in the United States. Because again, he and people like him are the pure example of the people seeking liberty specifically. And then we go here. And I challenge my Haitians and just Caribbean people, actually just global history, about where are the women. So oftentimes you'll hear Haitian feminists and womenists say, Kote Famio, right? And Kote Famio is like the neutral way of saying it is like, where are the women? And really, like, you got to put that piquelis, that Haitian hot sauce on it. It's like, where are the women? Like, food, where are the women, right? So we know Sanite Dalle, who you sort of see in that military attire and is commemorated again on currency, she cross dressed in order to participate in the revolution like uh, Jean Jacques de Saline. We're told that Jean Jacques de Saline married Empress Marie Claire Felicite Guillaume Bonnet or the short inversion, Claire Ilez, but in the constitution declaring us free, although his name is mentioned in all these slew of Haitian males, her name is not mentioned. She's listed as simply an empress. And then we have Catherine Flon, who sold our flag, which we love. We have Marie-Jeanne Lamatinier, who also fought in the revolution and just a slew of unnamed women. I think as Dr. Caroline Fick's book, I don't have it here, um, The Saint Domingue Revolution from Below captures so well, like the women who are just like, you know, I'm paraphrasing here with urbanness, where she's like, you could be the punk, she says to her husband, but I'm gonna stand here and I'm gonna die and we're gonna kill these children too and not give them to slavery and not give them to this slave institution, which I think is dope that we don't know the name of these women, but that we know of their actions, etc. So just saying their names, listing their names is always important to me. And then we have IT's early legal blueprints, whether it was Toussaint Liberté writing this constitution in 1801 when it was still attached to France, to the Declaration of Independence in 1804, Acte d'Independence, where Jean-Jacques de Saline, illiterate as a result of the consequence and effects of slavery, Roussini says to the people, citizen, 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 haïtien, haïtien, right? And it's an interesting way in which he perhaps is um, nodding and gesturing towards our griot tradition found on the continent and the way we tell stories in the Caribbean. But reality is that most of these people were illiterate. Obviously, education is not given to them. So maybe that's why he narrated the Declaration of Independence to Haitians and then told them to then go narrate it to people in Jacques Mel, in St. Mark, in Capaicia, et cetera, which I think is so dope. And then we have this 1805 constitution, and that's the one that I say, list these Haitian people, clearly all male, but do not do justice in terms of naming the women. Women enter the text as wives and as mothers, while men enter as free citizens, as soldiers, as beholden members of the state. And we're going to come back to this term, nationalisme. So then we come here, and this is so random, but not random, right? In terms of how the world is surveilling Saint-Domingue and what has now successfully become IET. So you would think that this is a, you know, like a, a what would be called a historical meme, right? If you think about a meme of this time period from back then. So randomly we're told that between 1828 and 1833, this image is released like decades after Haiti's revolution. Why? You know what I mean? Like, why would you incite this type of discourse and incite this type of pictorial violence? And this picture is so jarring. You sort of see IET inflamed with the revolution, there are ships being boarded, the old slave owner with her cane is fleeing, the dog is fleeing. And my favorite thing here is like, I can clearly see the variation of white people. I can tell that this man has a pafutan, a beard that cuts like this, that the sister has her, her head in a ponytail and other clear features. But then when I look at the black man and the black men don't see black of women, right? Even though women are participating in this revolution, 
homogeneous. They all look the same, same uh, color. And so in typical discourse that people think was the birth of civil war and reconstruction in the United States, what are we seeing, right? This white woman with her bodice open, her breasts demi, semi-exposed, demi-exposed, and the tall, healthy black slave fleeing to come and capture her and it's just like oh my god like thinking about images and how they tell stories and how they tell fictions of white superiority and the fiction of black inferiority that's all happening in here there's mass chaos and the thing that really sticks out to me too is how they uh title it Revolte générale de Neg, the Negro Revolt, the General Negro Revolt, Massacre des Blancs, like the whites are being massacred. What they don't tell you though, and this was fascinating, you fear us so much, and I think fear is such a bullshit excuse because you can't fear me and shoot me, and you can't fear me and still enslave me for centuries um, later. What they don't show in this picture is that as these white slave owners are fleeing, they're also packing up their enslaved population. And this is the birth of the Haitian population in Philadelphia, in New Orleans, and what today we now know as San Francisco, of course, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, and of course, Louisiana, right? So thinking about Haitian migration, not as a 20th century phenomenon, but happening in 1791 through the end of the revolution in November of 1803. So then, Nualila. And I love this. Obviously, this is a modern day painting created by Haitian. And he gestures us towards the ceremony that, um, <laughs> I'm going to just say it plain, popped off the revolution, what's known as the Boakayuma ceremony in August of 1791. And he does things so well, right? So we see Black people, they're looking different. Perhaps their skin tones are different as well. We see the fire. We see the Black pig that's about to get roasted and shared amongst all the people. And it's also an ode to the fact that when USAID came to Haiti in the 1960s, our Black pig went away. And then we now had a blanc pig, what they call the pink white pig of USAID. And then side by side, you sort of see uh, Cecile Fatima, the sister who helped organize this Bakayama ceremony alongside Bukmadati, who is, you know, repeatedly talked about in history. We see the drums, we see the machete, um, we see tools of agriculture, all these tools used to oppress this population that they're going to use to dismantle um, slavery and guide us into revolutionary success. And then the thing that I love that he does too, he puts Vodun all up in this painting, whether it's with the colors, the way that the fire is shining, the positioning of the wood for the fire, and then also the veves that are sort of like an homage to the Loise, and I guess Loise would be the equivalent of like spirit forces, orishas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's just a beautiful, lovely rendition of what the Bar Kaima ceremony was as a political movement that started the Haitian Revolution in August of 1791. And when I was in Haiti in 2015, looking at the 100th anniversary of the U.S. invasion, they, I learned <laughs> that they actually recreate this ceremony every year. And it's just so beautiful. Like even the fake black pig, like people come out. Sometimes they see Fatima as a transgendered person. It's just a beautiful rendition. And I thought about it, like Michel was to you when he's like, you know, what happens when you don't have sources told from people that look like us? And it's like said to have happened, said to have said to have happened. And the fact that in 2015, it's remembered exactly as this picture, I think it's just so dope about how memory and history operate side by side in IET and how they're using their own Caribbean tools to say, <laughs> we're professors as well, we're academics as well. So thinking about the images of Africans as dispossessed, um, I often like to put these images to show how, even though the woman's breast was exposed in the earlier slide, check out this picture of a sister who's caring for her young. And we all do this, whether we wrap that baby in the back or the front or the niece or the nephew, that it's done. Um, when they denied us the opportunity to have matrimony, right? Stamping out Black life, stamping out Black traditions, we jumped over a broom for matrimony. 
And then what we see happening everywhere, right? La cou, like community, like it's rare, like just growing up in Brooklyn, New York, and of course going back and forth across the Caribbean, it's rare for an elder not to live, if not in the same house, at least in the same vicinity as his grandchild or the godchildren. So thinking about community. Um, so in the face of them trying to say, we look the same, we sound the same, there's no variation and we're bandits and we're like just womenizers, etc. We don't care for our children. We're welfare queens. This is how black people also saw themselves and preserved in the archival footage. I think that's dope. So we come here. Haiti establishes itself November really of 1803, the end of the Haitian Revolution, and then it takes some time for the Acte Independence to be written um, by those who were literate. And so January 1st, 1804 is our national holiday where Saint-Domingue officially becomes restored back to Haiti. As some of you know, 1825 is when France hit Haiti with a reparations agreement, even though they loosely call it the indemnity agreement. France basically said, we will recognize 1804 and your success if you pay us back for loss of tobacco sales, sugar sales, loss of property that unfortunately included human beings. And Haiti at a time where the world really is just like eh, distancing themselves away from them outwardly, even though in secret the U.S. is trading with Haiti, um, Haitian president at the time agrees to this indemnity agreement and it costs the equivalent of $21 billion when 2004, when the then Haitian president, Jabetka Aïssid, calculated, he was like, France, you owe us over $21 billion. And we all know what happened to Aïssid in 2004 as well, right? So in 1826, I found this fascinating. When I was in graduate school, I was looking through congressional records and it was interesting to see how the Congress at the time said, our policy in Haiti is plain. We can't acknowledge your independence. And then you see how it takes it a step further. Like let's direct our ministers in South America and Mexique to protest against the independence of Haiti. So when people are like, and I hate this last name, that Haiti is the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere. First, I'm like, when did the survey come out? When was the last time they updated that survey? Have we looked at education and healthcare in the United States? So it's just like, wait, where's this coming from? But they don't then also say Haiti is the poorest, but also look at what the Congress did in 1826. I'm like, back up, learn your history, learn these facts as well. So it isn't until 1862 under uh, Abraham Lincoln's administration that the U.S. officially recognizes Haiti's independence. So I think that's important to highlight. So then we go here. And one of the reasons that IET is desirable for the United States is not only to keep surveillance on Black people in a Black nation. We can't have Haitians infecting our slaves in the South, infecting our slaves in the North as well. But also the United States feeling white US Americans, feeling very emasculated by the fact that they're not um, a presence on continental Africa in the way that Britain or the Netherlands is, right? And so the US, and Germany engage in like a multiple war about the Caribbean, but also about like shoring up their identity based on whom they can own. And so the Mole Saint Nicolas on the northern tip of Haiti becomes this piece, this bargaining chip, where U.S. presidents want it and feels like it could become a fueling station for its Navy, its growing Navy. But then you also see in this to the right here, Quote, the most St. Nicolas occupies such an importance as it faces the larger Americas, Africa, Europe, the outer world. So if you think about the most St. Nicolas occupying the same sort of significance as Samana Bay in Dominican Republic or Guantanamo Bay in Cuba and later the Panama and Nicaragua canals. This is what it's doing in this uh, late 1800s period. So what does the U.S. do? Despite the fact that Frederick Douglass escaped slavery when he was young, this biracial black male um, who identifies fully as black, Despite the fact that he is an abolitionist, a great orator, a great author, right, of several books at this time, rather than say, we're going to make him an ambassador of Haiti because of those qualifications, um, they're like, nope, we're going to make him ambassador of Haiti because they will racially identify <laughs> with a man that looks like him. And so in Frederick Douglass's private public musings, like it's a diary, but you could tell he's writing the diary for the public as well. Um, he has this to say. 
Uh, I know Haiti, she would rather abandon her ports and her harbors, blah, blah, blah. She lives proudly in the glory of her bravely won liberty and blood bought independence. And he muses a little bit about what does it mean to be so proud of IET, but then also really proud that he's an ambassador who can maybe smooth out the negotiation between these two nations. He fails at the task of getting the mole Saint Nicolas, so they immediately replace him with a white male who then arrives to Haiti with seven ships, right? And if you come to any nation with seven ships, that's a declaration of war. Let's call it what it is, right? So we go here at the moment of the invasion. And I guess just to back up, let me just go ahead in this slide. Okay, yeah, let me just back up here and say this. So the invasion, so okay, this is the background. July 27th of 1915, the Haitian president at the time, Villebon Guillaume Sam, is assassinated in part because of a lot of Cordillo-ism and political patronage type of politics and Haitians wanting a different ruler. They assassinate the man and then they decapitate him and chop up his body. By July 28th, 330 all white US Marines and military so military, Marines, as well as Navy, arrive to Haiti's ports, including Port-au-Prince, which is the central, it's our capital, and Cap Haitien, which is like the northern. So even thinking about these sites of oppression and invasion, it occupies the same sites as former big, large plantations, right? So thinking about how violence continues in different forms. So somewhere between the 27th of July of 1915 and the 28th, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson conferred with his posse, um, sanctioned the invasion of Haiti, gathered 330 troops, and they arrived to IET. How does that happen without pre-planning? How does that happen without um, surveying the nation? And that's what my book is arguing, that the United States has been obsessed with Haiti since the revolution, even before the revolution, 1757 with Mackandel's activities, constantly keeping surveillance on Haiti and the threat, the fear of Haiti in particular. So less than 24 hours after the president's death, these US military arrived in IET. They have what is called an election in reviewing the documents from their archives, but also in Haiti, it's really what I call a selection of the U.S., of the Haitian president. So you sort of see Haitian president Philippe Soudry d'Antiguinave, educated, of means, featured here. He's selected by uh, Washington, D.C., as well as the U.S. military. And I love how this picture um, shows him surrounded, flanked on all three sides by U.S. Marines, right? Who don't speak Creole, who do not speak French. And routinely in correspondence between Haiti, um, those officers in Haiti and D.C. is this idea that, listen, he's president because we made him president. He was, um, of the three candidates who put their name on the ballot, he was the one seen as more pro-U.S. American than Duc de Rosal Vobobo, um, and then this other one, right? So this idea, they would oftentimes threaten Philippe Soudouid and Tiguinav and say, you're president in Haiti because we made you president if we leave watch out in case of what happens to you. So thinking about, damn, like the role of the US military in Haitian politics, I think is important to consider. Then we go here. There's this thing called the US-Haitian Treaty of 1915. And although there's a semblance of parity of equality, it's not. So literally I go into, I think like 15 articles in the book from this treaty where it's like, Haitians could trade with the approval of the president of the United States. Haitians could build roads with the approval of da, 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 and it goes like that, 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 that. So if you're thinking about this nation that's promoting itself as progressive at the time, the United States as embodying democracy and for them to have this treaty, it's an act of violence is what I argue. Then we go to this 1918 constitution and it's authored by then Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, kin to Teddy Roosevelt who had invaded Cuba, um, et cetera, during the Cuban War for Independence and not the Spanish US American War. So you sort of see like this nepotism happening um, across the Americas with how white men step into these spaces. So in the 1918 constitution, and this trips me up, like I haven't found records of it, but FDR acting as assistant secretary of the Navy says, you know what? 
Haitians, although in their 1805 constitution says no white male can own property or own people, um, in this constitution of 1918, we're gonna say that Haitians could cede property to US Americans only. So not France, not nearby Dominican Republic, but only to US Americans. And it's hard to not then go, well, damn, how long have you been watching Haiti? Like, have you really just been involved in all of these constitutions for you to zero in on what Desalines said? No, there will be no white ownership of Haitian land. So it's important to consider the 1918 constitution, but going it back to the 1805 constitution. So then the U.S. does what it does well. It creates this National Guard, which is sort of like acting like a police, specifically to uh, squash and stifle Haitian resistance, and it's known as the Jean de Marie. And what they don't know is that the cacos and the people who are going to resist against their presence are infiltrating the gendarmerie. So although they're donning um, U.S. military attire, right, um, secondhand clothing for the Black Haitians as part of the gendarmerie, what I found is that these people were cacos members um, undermining the efforts of the U.S. military, which I was just like, oh my God, I'm so excited about this. So then we finally have the corvée. And this thing went, it's basically this project where the US military says, we're gonna do road construction, perhaps hospitals, perhaps railways, um, and clear roads and build some schools, but we're going to rope patients into doing it. Like literally they would say, um, here's the rope, send me back 50 volunteers. So Haitians with money, Haitians who were elite, could purchase their way out of this corvée requirement. And what that leaves is an overwhelming population of people who cannot pay, who are peasants, some of whom are landed because they're occupying lands as the elites are abroad in France or, you know, what's then um, Sweden and Switzerland. And so they're the people being roped into the corvée. And so these Haitians are resisting. They're like the blonde. These whites have come to restore slavery. They're roping us up. They're putting us in jail. They're not feeding us. And when we run away, they're shooting at us and killing us. So this idea of Corvée killings just runs amok in the U.S. military archives, but also how Haitians remember this period specifically. So the Corvée is going to inspire a lot of resentment and therefore recruitment of people fighting against the U.S. military specifically. Then we come here and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna drink water and we're gonna go through this, but I want y'all to just like read it on your own in terms of the sentiments of not only people in D.C., but also people on the ground in IEC. So I'm gonna come back in like a minute. Mm -hmm. So imagine a secretary of state with this level of lack of cultural competency, the fact that you don't even know that French and Creole are being spoken, right? John Houston Craig, Dr. Mary Render's great book about taking Haiti talks about his, um, just these Marines and their desire to whiten Haitians, not through a method of um, educating them with US textbooks as they did in Cuba in 1898 to 1902, but literally through raping, literally through sexual um, acts that were not consensual. And then you sort of see this dismissal of the Kakos, who are going to be the guerrilla fighters fighting against the military, as this. They're mislabeling voodoo, the religion. They're calling them ragged, poorly armed. Of course, they're calling them Negro, who are bandits. And then we run into this, which is from 1919, from one of the U.S. military, and he says, it's becoming necessary to destroy life-sustaining supplies, burn huts, and in order for the bandits to not find protection from the rain. And I love this because it happened in 1919. Every year of this invasion from 1915, through that point, they're like, we got it under control. Resistance does not exist. We run Haiti and Haitians bow down to us. And yet you're saying that, wow, people are perhaps protecting the Kakos and people like Shalman Pirat um, in their homes or providing them with rice or providing them with corn or sugar cane, et cetera. So this idea that um, they're saying resistance doesn't exist, but oh, we need to burn huts down because people are harboring these Haitians. You know, I expose some of those contradictions and really lies, let's call it what it is. And then we go here. So here's Shalman Pirat, right, born in 1885, sort of getting all of the infusement of the Haitian revolutionary discourse, right? He's born in the era of the success of the revolution of 1804. Uh, he's born in Ansh, which is like north central Haiti, and his mom's name is Masina Pirat. 
and his dad was a general in the army, Remy Perat. His father had five other boys, but for Masena Perat, uh, Charlemagne Perat was her sole biological son, although she takes in the other kids and has good relationships with them as well. Excuse me. He's educated at a prestigious school in Haiti, St. Louis Gonzague, and he assumes the role through his father's legacy, but also through his brothers who are political as well, through this like cordial system of political patronage, like I'm rooting for this president, but if I know this other president's going to come out in two years and it's going to make me ascend from mayor to governor, um, that's how the Pirat family and a number of people are assuming their sort of like political ascendancy at this time. He's also an agriculturalist and will become the mayor major leader of the Kakos, who again are guerrilla fighters against this U.S. invasion. And I love this. So I'm in IEC doing field work in 2006, two years after IEC is deposed, um, and two years into the UN occupation invasion of IT. And I see this mural and I'm like, oh my God, I'm in a top top that's just like going so fast. I'm like, I need to get off this top top and capture this picture, which I love. Um, and you sort of see this happening in 2006. These mural activists and artists are saying, Shalman Perat is needed in Haiti in 2006. But you know what? Shalman Perat on par with Jean-Jacques Salim is needed. So I just thought it was so beautiful that they bring in Shalman Perat's words um, that he writes in Kakos letters and in letters to US President Woodrow Wilson um, in this one mural. And he says, it's not the work of 1804, of Salim, other brave souls that we must smash or cause to be smashed. We shall not not permit the insulting strangers to step on us like they are our masters, right? And so Haitian people who are considered illiterate and undereducated and poor are out here doing all of this pedagogy, critical racial theory, uh, political science just happening right here. And excuse me, the fact that the mural is next to this uh, this advertisement for Immaculée Lunette, a place that sells <laughs> sunglasses and eyewear, and then faintly you see the letters UN crossed out with an X, I think it's just so dope. It's almost as if they're saying, down with the UN, open up your eyes, look at your past of Shalman Pidat, as well as Jean-Jacques de Sally, which I'm just like, yes, 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 yes. This is why we need to study in Haiti and the larger Caribbean and don't believe it. It's as dangerous as Lorraine where I live and as dangerous as Brooklyn, New York <laughs> during the crack epidemic. You know what I mean? Like pick your danger. And so with Kako Mentalité, you sort of see this birth or this rebirth of nationalisme where they're saying, we need to protect our nation and our citizens by all means necessary. And then I found this um, sort of like this paradigm of this practice amongst the U.S. military, where en Creole it's called couteau de bois, or voyez wash cachemé, and you see the translations there, where they would say Shalman Pirat and the Kakos are not political. There are a whole bunch of bandits, blah, say blah, 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 and yet they're like, oh my gosh, she's organized. Oh my gosh, we need to sit down with them. Oh my goodness, they're writing letters. Oh my God, they're like contacting France and British ambassadors. So it's just like pick, like pick one. Like what are you gonna? classify them as. So in my book, I talk about how they're political and how people like Shalman Pirat, although he doesn't say the term patriotic kinship, the fact that he embodies it really inspires a generation of Haitians who are protecting him in the cockles by staying silent or giving them food or not disclosing information when the U.S. military is down their throat asking where Shaman Pirat is. And so I deploy the term patriotic kinship to mean, um, you know, sort of like Ubuntu, I am because we are kind of thing. Ippy, we go here. And I love this because this, these two things here are some of the images of the cacos that I found in the U.S. military archives. And it just like, dismisses and contradicts their image of the Kakos as agricultural peasants who are bare feet, right? They're like well-dressed, like the portraiture of Black respectability. They got the hat, they got the suit, they got the little, the little handkerchief, etc. And this is what the Kakos do and do it so successfully. They engage in simultaneous fights, whether it's erupting in Jacqueline and Esh. They're doing murals of their time, right? Saying down with the U.S. military. They're staying quiet. They're shooting with bamboo. They're destroying commercial property. So you sort of see, like, if we think about that Boakaimo ceremony from 1791, like using those tools of oppression and like destroying them, I think is so dope. And then you sort of see this image of God, country, and family being reiterated over and over. 
And what I mean by across Haiti and Dominican Republic, I found this one CACO member who in IT was named Pierre Pined. And then in Dominican Republic where he escaped, he was known as Pedro Pineda. So I just think that is so dope, right? Like the clever ways that these people are resisting. And then finally here with the declarations in the Haitian press about Savannah, Georgia. So every May, which is Haitian Heritage Month, in the nation's newspapers, they would be like, well, what about Savannah, Georgia? You know, so they're like reminding the U.S. that if we weren't fighting in Georgia, maybe y'all revolution wouldn't have been successful. So you sort of see the multiplicity of political ways that these people are fighting either privately, but also very publicly, right? To write a letter to President Woodrow Wilson, CC, the British and French ambassador, is just pretty, just genius at the time, at a time when they're calling these people bandits. And then from this movement, again, Kuti Famio, right? The women enter this movement very unnamed or in categories like Kako spy, Kako wife, market women. We don't know their names. They're not listed. And so with honor, with respect, and I went back and forth about this, like, is this the right thing to do? I name all the women that I encounter with stereotypical Haitian names, like Gislaine, like Agat, like Marie Jeanne, et cetera. And so you sort of see this woman here, you know, lovingly <laughs> caressing her gun. Um, and even though we can tell that maybe she's of lower economic needs or doesn't have access to a washer um, at the time, that she knows how to shoot. She she holds it with a firmness. She holds it and she's staring out with a purpose. And y'all can't see it here, but there are two men languishing in the background and she's the one um, front and center. And I think that's so dope. So I named her Madame Gislaine in the book. And then we have Madame Messina Perat, uh, Perat's dad. And in Duke, uh, they just came out with the Haiti Reader last year. So I wrote this uh, brief snippet about how um, Asena Perat was sort of like an eye and ear for Shalman Perat as well as the Perat um, brothers, where at one point she writes in this letter, there's several letters, right? And she says, you weigh things to see what you should do, take care of yourself, be always ready, but lay low and get information from all other, from all over the country. And there's like this way that she's like being so maternal, thinking about her beloved, like take care of yourself, but also like telling him to, move this way or don't move that way. And I was just like, I just love this. So this is like book project number two <laughs> that already has an interest. Shalman Perat, they kill him. It's a lynching. There's a postcard, they board planes. And our people, Haitians are like, huh, no, this is how they interpret this lynching, right? So he's alive and he's resurrected. Perhaps that's his mom. Perhaps that's Mary Magdalene, if you are biblically literate. Um, and then how Haitians keep him alive today, right? He's always living, never that dispossessing image. And then we got to name these women, um, these women who formed the Ligue Féminine d'Action Sociale uh, during the invasion period. And here are their names. And then here's my book that I'm so excited about is out. And then the bolded people are the folks who are Haitian who've done the work of studying Haiti and done it well. C'est tout. Sorry for going over. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, and I'm sure our audience was absolutely riveted. The images were fantastic. Um, I learned things that I um, didn't know. Uh, full disclosure, I could not put your book down. Um, and I, I was, I was just, I, I think I have lots of post-it notes and um, things I want to remember. Um, I'm going to start us off with a question, and then I would love people in the chat to um, type in a question, and I'll try to go in order or group them if it makes sense thematically. Um, my first question is about um, what you said kind of at the beginning of your presentation. You talked about the importance of resistance and being named, and I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about this idea of why naming matters so much um, for your work because you, you touch on it with women, but um, there are so many times in your book where you underscore the name and I, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. Just because like doing research in Haiti, it's as neat and orderly as when I was doing research in the military archives or, you know, the DC in Maryland, etc. And I think like the way that Haitians remember names, either in a drumming circle 
or in a church with priests who are just like, listen, Jean Mapedat was a voodooiza, a practitioner of vodun, or the way he sung about, I mean, they won't let this man die. Like in every part, like 1934, 1946, onwards through Minusta, they're calling on Chalman Pirat, but I'm like, yo, how come we don't know the name of his mom? Or he, when he's lynched, there's a woman by his side. I still do not know her name. And so like, what does it mean for us as scholars who are conscientious to name or call out these men who are not doing what they need to do? Um, I, I think that, that your efforts um, to, to sort of give names to these um, women who participate um, in armed resistance, but also in resistance in other ways is um, an important intervention. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. Please send questions if you have them. Um, I'm wondering if you can um, also talk about um, this idea of the precarity of the Jean de Couleur and how um, there's this liminality of this freedom mm -hmm. and how um, we can even read that precarity into the present sort of even in the post um, earthquake 2021 Haiti, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of um, the narrative that we've been told about Haitian precarity. I, I, I love that you resist that, but I also think it's important to sort of talk about why that is part of history. Yeah, definitely. I think there's like a refusal to see Haitians as full people, as multicultural, multiliterate, as people who are doing calculus by the fifth grade. Like I remember when like my sister or just other family members migrated here and they're like, what is this fifth grade stuff you're doing of long division or decimals? Like we're so advanced, but yet when you look at media, 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 they're so consumed with painting Haiti in a particular light. And so one of the reasons that I love about that slide is that you get to see Haitians that don't look like me or look like white clef, but to see like they look like everybody in this room, right? And are as problematic as I'm sure everybody in this room is, there's some who are elite who don't mess with people. Like I could sometimes be the darkest member in Haiti in a room, right? And then also oftentimes not. And so thinking about just like the Jean de Coulet, but also just like the popular in general, like, I think very much like the United States being a Black heterosexual woman who didn't speak English at, in her home or in her little Haiti space. I only spoke English at schools and with Mayor David um, Dinkins when he was acting up with Haitians or the police when they were acting up with Haitians. That there's a particular way where I'm proud of being U.S. American, but then I'm also like, <laughs> I'm concealed carry because y'all fools will act up against me and I have the right to defend myself. And so I think there's an interesting way in which we need to think about Haiti who are the Haitians that we're talking about? Is it a woman? Is it a queer person? Um, is it someone who's poor? Is it someone with land? In very much the same way that we talk about US Americans who are indigenous and those who are peeing in the outhouse in Missouri and those who like me didn't have access to a quality education but somehow got a whole PhD. You know what I mean? So yeah, just thinking right. about going beyond the single story basically. I love it. Um, we have a question from um, Professor Ruiz. He says, I'm hoping you will speak a bit more about how you shed light on the broader transnational histories of the Americas through Perot. I'm thinking here of connection, I think, that you make at some point with Augusto C. Sandino, Nicaragua, See. and parallels. Mm -hmm. um, and Jesus, feel free to jump in too. Definitely. And I'm sorry, I know I just read the chat and somebody wanted me to share the last three slides. Definitely. I think when I first started this project and coming from this Latin American studies background, I was like, oh my God, this is Sandino, this is Zapata, and someone else, Amilcar Cabral. And my, my crew, my dissertation committee was like, so hold up, you going to do continental Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean? No, you will not <laughs> do that. And so I did a zero in focus on... Um, on Charmant Pirat and the Cacos, and sometimes looking at the Gavileros, but they're so different, um, right? Or they have like different uh, textures um, to them. But I definitely see a parallel, like, um, yeah, with the Sandinistas and definitely with Zapata in particular. So yeah, so there's just ways. And you know that book, Martyrs of the Revolution that came out, they talk about Spanish speaking figures um, like Shalman Pirat, but never about Shalman Pirat. And I'm like, do people not know about him outside of Haiti? 
So yeah. Right. I mean, I, I am surprised um, that the, particularly the, the iconography um, of um, Peral is not sort of read alongside the Conspiración de la Escalera in Cuba, for oh example. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That's your, I mean, I'm like, that's the book, that's the book I want to see, um, but, but framed in that way. Um, I think Professor Castillo also had a question. Definitely. Also. Yes, thanks. And, and actually, it, it feeds off of Jesus' point and then what Gretchen was just talking about, too. Mm -hmm. So the, the diaspora looms large, I think, in, in your, your, your conceptualization, your book. Um, and, 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 I and I would also say probably in, in, in the construction of the field of Haitian studies, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, so as the nature and the scope of the, the Haitian diaspora over the last 15 years, um, has changed and it has become infinitely more continental at a scale that hadn't been the case before. Yeah. Um, do you think that, and, and going back to this idea, I mean, there, there is much more to be done in thinking about Haitian studies and Latin American studies in particular, right? And, and then certainly Latinx studies, Latino studies as it's intersect. I mean, the, the, so Haitian studies in a way is kind of beautifully positioned to kind of connect in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but, but let's, and so while we're probably all in agreement for this, can you maybe walk us through a little bit some of the, the rubs or the tensions as to why this is, because, you know, as a 19th century person, we, you know, it, it has been, as, as you know, right? I mean, we, connected the dots between the Haitian Revolution and infinite parts of, of, of global history, but certainly Latin American right. history. But I think that it does our sort of general, not, uh, historiographically thinking, right? I mean, a Latin American that should be reading the Haitian studies journal, right? A as part of, but it doesn't happen, right? Yeah. And, and I don't, and I don't, I can't speak to the extent to which it happens or not vice versa, but maybe mm -hmm. you can kind of Talk us through a little bit about this. And Definitely. No, yeah. it's also, I'm with you on that. I'm like, like I teach a course called Radical Thinkers and Movements. And we start off with, who do we start off with? They look at Queen Nanny. They look at Naya Santua. Then we go to Arturo Schomburg. I'm like, stop calling him Arthur. Um, we go to the queer community in Jamaica and Amy Jakes Garvey, because Marcus Garvey is just like woefully overdone and not the women of the movement. And what students are like, they're like, wait a minute, there are Black people in Cuba. There are Black Puerto Ricans, who is the largest bibliophile for African-Americans, like the Schomburg Center, um, or that there are Chinese in Jamaica or in Cuba. And I, I love the way that back in the day, it seemed like we collapsed geographic boundaries in favor of revolutionary ones. So if you think about Schomburg contributing um, along with Jose Marti and so many of the women who are unnamed in Harlem and what's become Spanish Harlem, contributing to the folks on the ground uh, in Cuba. And then Haitians providing arms and money to Cubans at the time. There's an interesting way in which, I don't know, I feel like 1898 sort of stopped that but then we find this African-American population coming to Haiti, whether in the form of the NAACP or the UNIA and stirring this up, which then of course brings us to United Fruit, Dole, Chiquita, so labor class color and race, but it's not done enough. Where I'm just like, hello, to talk about our tour Schomburg is to talk about, you know, like I was thinking about your point Gretchen with um, La Escalera. Like one of the things they char were charged with was being too, they were reading too much Haitian stuff at the time. But exactly. That, yes. That's I love one, that the, um, one of the, um, I want to call it like the charges, the, the documented, what are they like? If someone knows this number on this call. I know you do. I think it's 97 charges. Yes. Um, sorry that I don't have that number right there, but there is a list of charges. I know I want to pull the book too from behind me. I will, I will, I will get that number in my head. Yeah. Um, and one of them is reading Desaline um, mm -hmm. pages. And one is also um, um, bringing in contraband newspapers. Yes. Right? So if you brought in the Haitian news, that was an act of, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, then, 
Gretchen, like, you know, when the U.S., like the Hershey Company comes into Cuba, who are they recruiting? Jamaicans, uh, dark skin, uh, Bayesians and Haitians. And then, so I haven't been to, what is that part of Cuba? Matana? Matanzas. Matanzas. <laughs> Where I'm like, yo, you look like you could be my daddy. Like, we look alike. The Creole that they speak sounds exactly how I sound when I speak Spanish. It's so, like, Creole French heavy. So it's an interesting way in which that comes back up again, and especially with we know with the PIC, the Independent Party of Color, how Haitian and anti-Black discourse enters there too. But Sato, just to bring your point back in, I wish we would stop that. Like even with immigration, like listen, if you're going to speak against a Palestine immigrant, it triggers me to thinking about how you treated my family as Haitians. That triggers me to think about how you treated dark-skinned Cubans and vice versa with Mexicans. So thinking about immigration perhaps as maybe the thread that'll get us all on this immigrant lives matter movement that seems to be bubbling up, but then is stopped based on you're Asian, you're Latin American, you're black. And I'm like, come on. So yeah. Um, we could talk with you for <laughs> um, and I would love to. Um, right. Thank you so up. much. Um, I didn't address. Okay. Yeah. Um, come. We would love to have you. Um, I will say that I've gotten a couple um, DM requests in the chat that they would love to see the last slides a little slower. So if you okay. could email those to Colleen, um, sure. we could send them to the people who attended this call, obviously crediting, crediting you. And um, if you could all join me in a virtual thank you uh, to um, <laughs> Professor um, Alexi. We um, so appreciate your participation in um, Vanderbilt's Haiti Week. And thank you so much for your time. And thanks Aww. to all of you on the call. Thank you so much as well for making this time. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for the invite.